This production has been brought to you by the Fresno Mycology Society. Recently, I finally decided to invest the time and money into a fully functioning mushroom fruiting chamber. For years, I've fiddled around with various methods of mushroom cultivation, but my half-hearted attempts yielded equally half-hearted fruits. The reason being, in my opinion, was the general lack of controllability offered by the various styles of fruiting totes and monotubs, which are the most popular low-budget options. To be clear, many people have a lot more success with those setups than I had, but after much wasted time and money, pathetically small flushes, and more contamination than any reasonable human being should expose themselves to, I decided to get a little more serious. So join me as I walk you through this build. Now, right up top I want to say that this is not a budget option. This build has cost me over a thousand dollars, but I wanted to make sure that this chamber would be controllable, safe, and long-lasting. And to be fair, this is literally a money-making machine we're building, and one could certainly recover the cost of investment in a relatively short period of time. As we go through, I will list the prices of each component so you can get an accurate idea of all the costs involved. For this project, I went with the AC Infinity Cloud Lab Hydroponic Tent. They make a variety of sizes, but for the space I had available in my closet, I decided on a 2x4x5 foot tent. There are literally hundreds of different hydroponic tents, but I chose this one because it was well reviewed, affordable, and offered several sleek modular upgrades that I was interested in. I'll discuss these in a moment. This tent has several cinchable ports, solid zippers, reflective and waterproof mylar interior lining, a viewing window, and a very handy drip liner. To maximize the vertical interior growing space, I decided to go with a stainless steel wire rack. Before placing the racks into the tent, I sprayed them down with a protective clear coat to increase the rust resistance. I decided against plastic racks, which would have been completely rust resistant because wire racks allow more top-down light penetration to the lower shelves versus plastic racks, which are generally totally solid and cast complete shadows. It may seem surprising that fungi need any light at all. In fact, I seem to remember my uncle once comparing himself to a mushroom as everyone had a tendency to keep him in the dark and feed him a bunch of shit. But despite the common assumption that mushrooms prefer total darkness, they do require at least a small amount of light to orient themselves properly as they grow. And mushrooms grown in complete darkness often become very spindly and deformed. Also, research has shown that many species of mushrooms produce higher amounts of vitamin D when exposed to full spectrum UV incorporated lights. And this brings us to the next part of our project. Lighting, for many years, has generally been the most energy-intensive component of any grow operation. But modern LED panels are not only achieving higher overall output, but are also massively more efficient than, say, a high-pressure sodium light. Many models also have really good moisture resistance, which is important in a superhumid fruiting room. Another consideration is the light's heat loss efficiency. Many traditional high-output grow lights give off tons of heat, and as most mushrooms are mesophilic, like us, they tend to do best in a temperature range between 68 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Therefore, an overly hot light is out of the question. With all that, and a budget in mind, I settled on the MaxiSun PB1000, a 100 watt remote adjustable full spectrum LED panel that has high efficiency Samsung diodes, which I'm told is a big deal. The unit also has an IP65 moisture rating, and after a couple growing cycles, it seems to be tolerating this demanding high humidity environment just fine. This light is also modular and can be daisy chained to another unit if you choose to increase your grow space down the line. Another key component for happy mushroom growth is adequate air circulation. Fungi, like animals, Expel carbon dioxide as a byproduct of their metabolism. In a closed system like we're building here, this can often lead to excessive CO2 buildup, which can inhibit the growth and pin set of most mushroom species. To avoid this problem, 
We are adding a ducted inline fan to periodically circulate fresh, clean air into the fruiting room. Here, I went with the AC Infinity Cloud Lab T4 inline fan. This fan is made for this tent, and the control panel the tent came with mounts the fan's control module in a really clean, sleek way that helps keep all the wire mess under control. Because if there's one thing in this world I really hate, it's a mess of tangled wires. The T4 comes with its own control module, but the stock version is not as programmable as I was hoping, so I upgraded to the Controller 67, which allows you to really dial in the unit for whatever parameters you want. This upgraded unit is also a Bluetooth capable smart controller that allows you to set schedules, on off cycles, multi parameter responses, and my favorite feature, it collects, tracks, and displays your temperature and humidity data all on your phone. A simple on off cycling feature was all I really wanted, and the stock controller didn't offer that, so keep that in mind. In addition to the controller upgrade, I purchased the Growbrite 4 inch HEPA intake filter to filter the air that was pumped into the tent to reduce the contamination load. As the intake filter suggests, this tent is set up to create a positive air pressure, pumping air from outside the tent into it. I decided to go this route because I'm extremely paranoid about contamination, and with positive pressure chambers like this, the clean, filtered air is pushed into the tent and out of any of the holes, seams, or ducts in it. If the flow were to be reversed in a negative pressure configuration, the air would be sucked into the chamber from the aforementioned holes and seams, and contaminant spores from outside the tent would be allowed to flow through those leak points. The benefit of a negative pressure system is that the high buildup of mushroom spores produced within the tent will not be blown out into your living space through those leaks, but be sucked out from your grow room through a duct that presumably feeds safely outside. Many people are aware that mold spores can be hazardous to your health, but not so many people seem to understand just how dangerous high concentrations of mushroom spores can be. Chronic exposure to oyster mushrooms in particular, which produce a truly astonishing amount of spores, can lead to a condition called mushroom worker's lung. For real. So, to avoid a complete inundation of spores into my living space from my positive pressure chamber, I've added a duct which connects to a board in the nearest window and ejects the spore-laden air out of my house. Now originally, I planned on simply adding a sensitive backdraft damper in line with this exhaust duct to allow exhaust to flow out and prevent the dry, hot, contaminated air from outside my house from backflowing into the grow room. However, the amount of internal pressure generated by the intake fan was not strong enough to open the damper, so I had to add a second inline fan to the exhaust duct to push the exhausted air past that damper. Fortunately, the CON67 is able to power two separate fans simultaneously. Unfortunately though, it does not allow you to independently control the speed of both, and since my intake fan has a HEPA filter which adds significant resistance, and with the exhaust fan being uninhibited, the result was that the exhaust fan sucked more air out of the room than the intake fan would push in, thus creating an overall negative pressure. To compensate for this new problem, I cut out a 4 inch piece of plexiglass and drilled a relatively small hole into it, and fixed it to the back side of the backdraft damper. This added enough resistance to the exhaust fan to maintain a net positive pressure. A louvered exterior wall vent was installed to prevent water and little critters from getting into my duct. Now that that's taken care of, let's move on to the next part of this build. I love you. If the air circulation system can be thought of as the lungs of this chamber, then the humidification system is like the heart. For a space this size, you can get away with a smaller terrarium fogger, but I found even for this tent, a small fogger couldn't adequately keep up with the regularly cycling fan and resulted in many dried out or aborted mushroom primordia. For this reason, I purchased House of Hydro's 9-disc fogger. When researching foggers, you're immediately hit with thousands of nearly identical units with wildly mixed reviews, but one name that stood out as having good build quality and excellent customer service was House of Hydro, and though a bit more expensive than the competition, I'm glad I went with this unit. The order, of course, came with this massive, powerful nebulizer, and also included a full set of replacement ceramic fogger discs, and a float. Now, I could have theoretically installed this unit into a bucket and placed it directly inside the tent, 
but with the spore load I was anticipating, I decided to duct it in from the outside of the tent to avoid fouling the water in the blower fan with spores. So, in order to do this, I built this little modular humidifier tote. When selecting your tote, make sure to get one with a waterproof gasket and snap locks like this one. This will prevent your room from leaking fog and slowly turning into a bog. I cut one 4 inch hole on one side of the tote lid and bolted on a 4 inch plastic shroud using nylon bolts, nuts, and rubber washers to avoid any corrosion. I also added a bead of silicone around the inside edge of the duct to prevent leaking. Now, while this nebulizer does pump out a massive cloud of fog, without airflow, it simply settles in the bottom of the tote. For this reason, I cut a 4 inch hole in the opposite side of the tote and bolted on House of Hydro's waterproof ducted fan. This is one of the only CPU style fans I've found that is truly waterproof, and so far it's proven itself up to the task. The fan I ordered came with this very handy speed controller that allowed me to really dial in the output of the humidifier. I added a dust filter on the intake of the fan to avoid any unnecessary buildup of schmutz. Next, to allow the humidifier cord to pass through the lid, I cut a 1 inch hole into the tote and glued in a homemade gasket with silicone. I later made a second gasketed hole for a submersible UV sterilizer filter. I added the sterilizer because after a couple refill cycles, I noticed a slimy film building up on the inside of the tote and the water becoming a bit frothy. This is either due to some sort of algae growth or from the precipitation of minerals out of our hard tap water. As this UV filter also has a sponge pre-filter, I figured it would handle both possibilities. The last meticulous detail I'll mention are these little plexiglass flaps I glued in place. I did this because this monster mamajama of a fogger kept throwing water droplets up into the duct and, more importantly, the fan. These would eventually pool on top of the tote lid and leak onto my floor. But more concerning for me was the possibility of the water mixing with the electronics of the fan. And while I know it's rated for severe duty, bathing it in water felt like a recipe for another case of severe duty. On a cautionary note, it is highly recommended that you take precautions against the ingress of fog into your living space, especially wherever your tent meets a wall. Carpet and drywall will not hesitate to roll out the red carpet for mold and consistently damp conditions, so it's up to you to make sure the fog stays inside the tent. Though the walls of the tent are completely waterproof, the zippers, wire slits, and duct ports are far from airtight, and fog readily streams out from these points. To seal up my tent, I used waterproof duct tape to seal the entire length of the tent zipper and zip tied the duct ports that weren't being used. Not only will this help to prevent any chance of mold growth where you don't want it, but it'll also help to hold the humidity inside the tent and make the whole system more efficient. Maintaining proper ambient humidity is essential for the fungal fruiting process. Research has demonstrated that the deposition and evaporation of surface moisture on mushroom mycelium in the form of tiny water droplets is the primary trigger of fruiting in many mushrooms. To replicate this, we need to strike a balance between regular humidification and fresh air circulation, the former depositing water droplets onto the surface of the mycelium, and the latter evaporating it away. For this effect, it's important to have reliable controllers for both parts of the system, which brings us to the last part of the build. As previously stated in part 4, my intake fan is controlled by the AC Infinity Controller 67. You will have to figure out what ratio works best for you, but in my mush house, the fan is programmed to cycle on for 3 minutes and off for 15. Generally, you want your mushroom substrate to have visible moisture on the surface, but not puddles, though excess moisture is far more preferable than excessive evaporation. Over time, you will learn what happy and sad mycelium looks like and compensate accordingly. For the humidification controls, I'm using the Inkbird ITC608T. This controller has two available sensor inputs, one for a humidity sensor and another for a temperature sensor. The functionality of the outlets will change depending on which combination of sensors you have plugged in. For my room, both my humidifier and a top secret DIY AC unit are plugged in to work output 1 and 2 respectively. For such a configuration, I have both the temperature and the RH sensor plugged in. As you can see, the top of the display indicates the measured temperature of the chamber, 
and the bottom, relative humidity. Of course, the temp and RH preferences vary between mushroom species, but for now, I've been having success keeping my humidity at 88% with a differential of plus or minus 2%. Therefore, when the humidity drops to 86%, the controller kicks on the humidifier and shuts it off once it's reached 88%. I hope you found this video useful. I ran into a lot of little hiccups while constructing this tent and tried to impart the lessons learned onto you. And though my personal quest has only just begun, the controllability of this grow room has provided me with absolutely invaluable data in learning what makes mushrooms happy. Whereas before, I could only guess as to the specific reasons why my tote fruiting chambers succeeded or failed, the data provided by the fungalo is far more enlightening. And on that point, I've come to learn that the most important tool of successful mycoculture is indeed the humble notebook. While the CON67 logs humidity and temperature data over time, keeping meticulous notes on everything I do in this fruiting room has been the most valuable tool of all in understanding what makes a happy, healthy mushroom grow. So don't neglect your patent pen. Finally, I want you to understand that this style of mushroom fruiting tent is infinitely scalable and many mycoculturists have adopted this method at scale to grow and sell thousands of pounds of mushrooms per year. One of the first videos we ever made on this channel was of a local industrial mushroom farm called Sun Smiling Valley Farms. And while that operation was incredible to tour, the entire building was specifically constructed from the ground up to grow mushrooms. No doubt an incredibly costly venture. Using the methods covered in this video, however, the modern mycoculturist can simply rent any cheap, air-conditioned warehouse space and set up these modular grow rooms within it for a fraction of the price and with much less risk. For example, Mushroom Mike at Southwest Mushrooms in Arizona runs a thriving mushroom cultivation business that utilizes this method. But whether you're just a hobbyist looking to do a little DIY mycology, a home mushroom farmer, or a prospective venture capitalist, the aforementioned techniques and principles in this video are a good place to start. That's all for now. Until next time, happy growing! And a very special thank you to our patrons on Patreon. This video absolutely could not have happened without your generous support, and I really can't thank you enough. If you'd like to become a patron, you can find us as Fresno Mycology Society on Patreon, or you can follow the link in the description below. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Flickr. Peace.